Welcome to the MMHP in the 989. Podcasting from the Michigan Rock Legends Hall of Fame in downtown Bay City. Channeling all styles and eras of Michigan music history from, from the, the city, city by, by the Bay. Bay. And now, Dr. J, Sir Fred, Mr. Mike, and your host, Scott Baker. Where exactly? I was a little slush Coleman. in the spots. But I know I've been to Coleman, but where is it? <laughs> uh, just the other side of Midland. Yeah, west of Midland. Oh, okay. Uh, if, you're right. going up, if you're going west. After or before <laughs> Sanford? The other, after. After Sanford. Okay. Yeah. It, it goes, if, if you're running 75 or old 10, either one, it goes uh, Midland, um, Averill, Sanford, North Bradley, Coleman. Oh, and you got to remember those little towns are just, you know, population of eight. Yeah, yeah I'd never heard of North Bradley. Yeah, otherwise known as Buttonville. Buttonville. Back in the day, yeah. <laughs> we called it Zipperville. <laughs> and it was one of those places. It was like Hooterville. That's why we named it Zipperville. Yeah. It, it, the there is one store, and it was the post office, the the, the grocery store, the hardware store. I mean. Everything was in that one building, and it was no bigger than this. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a cool old post office. They had the old-fashioned boxes. You well, know. there you go. Well, <laughs> that was a while ago. Mm-hmm. So am I holding you up? What's- no, we're, we're just, everybody's <laughs> getting warm. Uh, we're back here at Studio 163. I'm going to start rolling tape right now if everybody's doing good. And uh, uh, how's things going? I mean, everybody's got a little bit of chill in them. Every, everything's going all right. You guys made it here fine. So we're finer back to, than frog hair. We're finer than frog hair. We got yeah. Levi Hooker Man in the house tonight. How are you guys doing? Good. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Good. Excellent. What she said. I'm with her. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. One car ride. We made it real easy on you all tonight. Yeah. We got uh, Dr. J in the house. How's things going, Doc? I'm real good. Uh, although we, this probably won't be broadcast when, uh, when the event takes place, but uh, our first uh, uh, partnership event between the uh, Michigan Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame and the Delta Planetarium. Uh, We're calling it Madonna 40, Mm -hmm. celebration of Madonna's first billboard hit, 1983. And we're going to uh, play some of her videos and uh, uh, show the award-winning short documentary, Smelly Little Town. Pretty excited about it because, man, the sound in that planetarium is outstanding. What about the tour? You, I'm sure you know she's on tour. You get, did you get tickets? Uh, you know, I looked into it. Yeah? A little too expensive for yeah. my blood. I know. <laughs> well, it, but they? pre-sale was Monday. You know, I joined the fan club just so I could get in the pre-sale. But uh, they wanted, you know, again, this is, you know, you're hearing all the complaints about Ticketmaster and everything. Well, this is Vivid Seats. You can imagine this. There was a two hundred and sixty dollar service charge. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you kidding? Me? <laughs> that's service that's charge. Good. Service. Oh my charge. lord! That was what? vivid seats. Oh yeah. I mean, it's crazy. What exactly does this service entail? I, well, they they allow you to buy it online, and then they put the ticket on your phone. Yeah. You know, that's, and that's the service charge. Oh my god! Wow. wow. Well, the ticket was. Um, I think three hundred and thirty dollars, which was pretty steep. But you know, we figured, well, okay, I can swallow that. But then again, you know, you're paying a sixty dollar insurance charge, but they're charging thirty percent of the price of the ticket as a service charge. Unbelievable! You know, it's just outrageous. And I was just reading, uh, you know, some of the testimony against Ticketmaster, and they're talking about, you know, how these these services now, many of them own the venue, uh, you know, they determine everything, and they are making more money than the, uh, the artist is. Yeah, some guy was on TV the other day during that, and he was in a band, and he said, we get six dollars. I don't know if he meant <laughs> the whole band or I mean out of out of each ticket. Out of the what ticket, yes. Yeah. Out of the ticket. Yeah, yeah. They're just you know, and they have got it so 
bound up so tight that you really don't have any choice, you know, if you want to go and see some of these acts. And it's everybody. Yeah. I'm sure it's going to be Springsteen, uh, you know, anybody down the line, uh, you know, you're going to have to deal with this if you want to see it. So you know, it was coming out that it was going to cost us $500 per ticket with all the additional crapola that, that you know, they're laying on you. And it was just it was terrible. I'll guarantee you, you look around the audience. I won't be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't either. <laughs> they priced me out on that one because we were going to have to get a room. You know, I don't yeah. like to drive home at that late at night, you know, especially from Detroit. So, you know, you're talking of, yeah, you know, a major investment here. Yeah. I would really love to see Madonna on this tour. Right. And I will say this about her shows. Uh, we did see the Rebel Heart tour, and it's it's a lot more than five guys or six guys sitting on stage. It is a major production. It was like Cirque du Soleil. There were acrobats and dancers, and yeah, it was oh, wow. really something. Wow. Yeah, it was great. Uh, that was probably the the most exciting concert I'd ever seen. Wow. Well, she has a few days. Her management about yeah. her doing the podcast. Well, um <laughs> I did. I I have been in contact with her uncle, and I gave him a tour of the uh, of the Hall of Fame last Friday. Oh. David Fortin. Nice. Yeah. So we we do have a connection. Uh, I don't know how much uh, contact he has with Madonna anymore. Well, you should contact uh, her publicist or. Yeah. Well, you know that's you're going through, you know, all kinds of different people and things uh, i think my best bet is david fortin oh, yeah. you know at least let the family know what's going on in yeah. bay city and that uh at least there's some segment of town that uh yeah you know it's not you know she's gonna be here or well she's up to traverse city right uh, yeah her time. father uh, right. and i think her father's birthday if i remember correctly is in august oh, or yeah. somewhere around that so there is that possibility, and I think I told you that his last birthday, she did come to town yeah. and laid flowers on the grave of her mother and um, and her grandmother. I wrote a little note. So there was a yeah, note there. A note as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, no, never publicizes no. any visits or anything like that. But no. yeah, she was definitely right. here. Wow. She yeah. was spotted at St. Lawrence Peanuts? Uh, not lately, but no, I, I that, see uh, some That was people. a river roar about yeah. 10 years oh, ago. Oh, oh that yeah. Well, that's when oh. she was married to Guy Ritchie. Oh. And he he accompanied her. But, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I see some people were, were saying, gee, why doesn't Madonna buy St. Lawrence Brothers? Because she used to go there as a kid. Yeah, right. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Buy Visitation Church. Yeah, buy Visitation yeah, right, Church. Right. And how about uh, Karis Red Lion? Because she used to like to go there as a kid. And then there's <laughs> the Bill Book and Candle, which is now a, a parking lot. Maybe she could rebuild the building and we got an idea. open up a bookstore. <laughs> right. sure. I mean, I didn't realize she was yeah, that yeah, yeah, That's right. <laughs> and Bay City has been so good to Madonna over the years. You know? I'm sure you'd be jumping at the chance. <laughs> I worked with a guy, and I don't know if I shared this on a past podcast, but he was riding his bike, and there's that side door at St. Lawrence, and she was popping out of it. And he just went to swerve because he seen the door open. And he fell off his bike, and he, you know, shook it off, got up, and it was Madonna helping him up. Sorry yeah. about that, honey. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, oh, what oh, a Madonna story. Called me honey. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, Mr. Mike, did you get your Madonna tickets? I know you probably got front row already. Uh, I, yeah, you get every I show. I was going to try the presale, but couldn't uh -huh. get my info on it. Yeah. But I will try tomorrow. Well, 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 I'm sure you'll have the report. And you'll have them. You are the man on the streets. Yeah. Third row to Jason Isbell this Sunday, if I heard correctly. Yeah. I'll be there. I'll be there. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, everybody's going to that show, I think. Oh, so it's one of Saginaw's first you, great you. shows in I don't know how long. Yeah. We just saw her Tuesday in Caledonia, so. <laughs> <laughs> Madonna? <laughs> That's awesome. Taking a, taking a ride through the countryside. <laughs> That's awesome. Sir Fred, what's up over there? You got your book done? Are we ready to read it? <laughs> Actually, it's getting real close. Good I for just, you. I just have to put it all together. It's there. Good for you. That's I'm not gonna. I don't think I'm gonna write any more on it. But I'm just trying to yeah. put yeah, it together. Yeah. And, uh, Good for you. Book number three. 
Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. We're starting to really get the feel. I mean, I haven't really broadcast any of this in any of the podcasts lately, but our numbers have really shot up since that uh, we had the Gilmore Brothers on here, and we did say that. But I mean, even since then, it's people are consuming the podcast all over now. Wow. Uh, we're, we were getting a lot of followers and a lot of people talking about books. I, I seen people last night talking about the Craig Mackey thing. So. Uh, that's great, you know, little things I pop in you guys' feed when you share it like that, and I was, I was just trying to follow where it all heads, you know. Yeah, I'm having a little trouble sharing on my uh, Michigan Rock and Roll Legends Facebook page. Has anybody had any difficulty, or is it just me? I had something pop up on my phone that you did something with it today, like it said. Uh, yeah, but it, it was a major operation, <laughs> you know, and I'm cutting and pasting and, really? you know, finally getting it up there. It's not just like, here, share, and here's the page, and click and it's on there and well we do have and it if, might be a spectrum problem we've got spectrum coming tomorrow and they have that as we'll see we've had spectrum problems for like three or four weeks now they're putting out new lines plus the weather uh, there's all sorts of issues going on but having said that uh there is at the for any of our listeners as well the we have a pinned post to the very top of our facebook page uh, which is our home hub uh that has all of our um, outlets for the podcast, including like Spotify, direct links, YouTube, direct link to Twitter, uh, direct, direct link to wherever you want to get it from. And our Libsyn podcast that hosts our podcast, you can download our podcast on there and listen to it. You can uh, stream it. You can do anything with that. That that one will let you cut, cut, paste, and copy right directly from that, which is like the last link in that group of links. But uh, anyway, if you guys wanted, instead of using Facebook sharing or, or whatever, you guys can go right to the links, too, and usually share off. All right, I'll try that. Maybe that'll yeah. work better than what I've been. You know, and it, it was it's only recently that I've had a problem with it. In the past, it was mm-hmm. easy as pie to it's do it. probably something going on local yeah. in the chain, then. I do know that uh, our YouTube videos have gone up. People realize that uh, when we post it, the shows, every show that's come out in uh, almost two years we've been together now, uh, that... The YouTube people that are watching it get to see the photos of the sessions, plus other photos that I found off the web or that the artists have sent me, whereas the regular listeners get the straight stream. Uh, but we, at some point, we're going to have video, too. Mike Beatty's looking yeah. into editing video clips and getting those out there. Uh, he's had a, over a year now of sessions that we can have video footage. So we're going to get to surprise, and we get to backlog some of the old stuff to remind everybody. But they're still going through it, and there's a lot of hits on it, so it's really good. But... Let's get over to the town of Coleman here in mid-Michigan near Clare. That's where we're heading tonight in Michigan. Uh, from all the artists and authors and people we've talked to about music around Michigan, we really haven't had anybody directly from the heart of the state. You guys have been a stronghold in the heart of the state for long as I can remember. I mean, I recall Levi in the 80s. Uh, Hooker Man, I'm sure you have... And, I, and I've seen the backstory, so I know a lot longer. But uh, <laughs> being that you guys are, you were solo artists or in, in bands or whatever, but then you became one, getting married and going out. And, uh, but people could still find the Levi Rose experience on, on the web, as well as uh, your guys' shows whenever they happen, which have been really minimal since COVID. But uh, take us back to, let's start with Hooker Man. The, 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 go, take us back to how you got inspired to, play get everything going how did the music how'd you get your guitar in your hand or harmonica or i what? grew up in a rural community very small community coleman and there wasn't much of anything to do in coleman uh, the big thing was you would climb the walls in between two buildings and get on the roof and throw water balloons at people <laughs> but, i mean that was the entertainment in coleman <laughs> And uh, I listened to the radio all the time. I went to sleep with it on. I, you know, I listened to music. Music was my escape from the humdrum of living in a rural community. And uh, I wasn't but maybe 12 or 13 years old the first time I heard uh, uh, Johnny Winter playing that slide guitar. And at 12 or 13, I said, that's what I want to do. I don't want to go to school. <laughs> I don't want to get a job. I want to play that. Well, then I heard some other people that were very influential. Uh, the Animals came out with House of the Rising Sun. Oh, that just blew me away. I said, well, okay, that's pretty good, too. And uh, I decided I needed to play guitar. Fortunately, my father's family and my mother's family were all musicians. They played every instrument that there is. And my dad always had an old, uh, usually it was a, T-Skull or a Harmony, 
electric guitar and a little cheap amp that he would set and play C, F, and G and do his country stuff. And then I'd turn it all the way up so it was distorted really bad, and I'd <laughs> play the stuff I wanted to play. And I kind of learned a little bit of this and that, and that's how I got started in it. I just, music was my escape from where I didn't want to be. <laughs> well, in Coleman, and you're saying that both sides of your family were musicians or musical, right. was there anybody that did anything playing-wise regularly or any, any, any anything uh, noteworthy my, that you can remember? My mother and her father used to play the 702. <laughs> <laughs> in Midland. In <Yeah>. Midland. <laughs> uh, my mother grew up in Midland. Yeah. Uh, her maiden name was Finney. Her name's Pearl Helen Finney, and my grandpa's name was... Uh, what the hell was his name? Bert. So they used to play the 702 when she was just a teenager. And they'd play for drinks and tips. Of course, my mother didn't get the drinks or the tips, but she, she had the fun. Yeah. And uh, she played piano, and my grandpa played violin, and they just tore it up. Did I they ever get out of town and do it, too, or just, just 702 is your memory? That's well, that's it. all I, I know of. Yeah, okay. And I didn't even learn that until... 10 years ago. Amazing. When we were playing the 702, <laughs> and we stopped at my mom and dad's, and we were talking, and they asked where we were playing this weekend, and we told them the 702, and my mom went, is that still open? <laughs> oh, man. And I said, well, yeah. She said, I used to play there with your grandpa. <laughs> so Dang. I was really, really tickled to hear that. Cause she, oh, she had a voice like an angel. She <laughs> could sing at harmonies. Hmm. She could harmonize with a washing machine. <laughs> we did a recent podcast with uh, Scott Seberger, as well as a couple of people from the Midland-oriented area. And uh, Scott's really into the Midland music history, and he'd probably be really interested to hear some of this stuff. Yeah. yeah that's amazing. Because you don't think, you know, everybody hears Detroit or, you know, Ann Arbor or Lansing. And right. And I, and I had never heard of my mother playing out. The, like I say, her her father and all of her brothers and sisters played piano and violin. You name it, they played it. And uh, we had hoot nannies at Grandpa Finney's. And, buddy, I'm telling you what, that was some music going on. They had harmonies like, wow. Any relation to Al Finney? Al? Al? Probably. My mother had 14 brothers and sisters. Okay, because he's from Midland. So he's, I'm probably Blues related. player. Probably related in some fashion. Or I was going to ask you, Fred. That sounds like something that we've talked about in the past. Like, I couldn't think of how, but yeah, you you know those. You, his Fred's got the old memory of going way back for some of these things. So yeah. Well, like I say, there were <laughs> fifteen little finnies running around. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Responsible of my grandpa, Bert. Hmm. Did you uh, form a band once you got interested in in playing the blues and more than I even want to count. I, I, was I, it like a high school? Did you start well, that early? in high school, I wasn't really good enough to play out. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I hadn't even tried to master the guitar. I was playing the drums. And I, I tried to get into a couple of bands doing that. And what happened was I just decided you couldn't, I couldn't put my drums in the trunk of my Mustang and go serenade my girlfriend. <laughs> so I decided I needed a guitar. Because I had a girlfriend and a Mustang, and, you know, that was where I needed to go. So, uh, that's why I picked up the guitars. I really like girls. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Following any grandpa's footsteps there. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I would think. Yeah. Yeah. I would think yeah. So if we jump way ahead in time here, how did you end up hooking up with uh, Leon Russell? How did uh, that well, ever I was happen? working a duet act called Hooker T., I believe this was 1983, and we had been working together for a while. We were playing the Mason Jar and uh, uh, Bushies, and I In can't Midland. remember the name of the one that was out on the corner of Bay City Road there. Anyway, we were playing the duet, working that circuit there, and a guy came in, and he saw our show, and he asked if we would come play a Halloween party for him and his friends. Offered to pay us a pretty reasonable amount, so we said, sure. We went and played the party, and they liked us, which I guess I shouldn't have been that surprised, but I was. And uh, the guy that threw the party come up and said, uh, can you do that for two hours? And I said, well, yeah. He said, uh, how would you like to open for Leon Russell? 
And I, once they picked me up off the floor, I said, well, yeah. So he offered me good money to do that. And I said, okay, well, we got it. Well, let's do this. So it was in uh, Flint at the Capitol Theater. And uh, there's 2,000 people in the crowd. And we opened up the show, played seven songs, seven of my originals, and uh, just tore it up. Had a great time. And then Leon, I've always been a huge fan of Leon Russell, I am to this day. Uh, of course, him and his people tore it up. And afterwards, we all met, I can't remember the name of the bar, but we met at this little bar for chili dogs and beer. And uh, the guy that hired us come running up, face red, and his ears red, and his you know, eyes bugging out of his head. He said, I, I just got the earlier reviews. And... T-Bone and I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> we, we hadn't ever been in that caliber before. And we went, yeah. And he said, you guys got better reviews than Leon Russell. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I went, that's it. I could die now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, what were you playing? Were you playing blues? It was, Sorry? Was it blues? Well, it was like a folk blues. Back then, uh, I had, okay. I'd going into the acoustic because I just... The electric blues kind of it's too hard to find any place to hide to hire you to play it but the folks music was working it was pl playing so we that's what we went with and uh i wrote a bunch of songs you know folky campfire kind of things but we played them with enthusiasm <laughs> <laughs> now you guys going back into before that even in the 70s when you first started getting out you, were you doing uh, electric back then, and then you switched to the folk, or was it always been up to that point kind of more folky? Where did you, where did you find the niche? In, I or really the break didn't point? get into the electrics until the eighties. Oh, uh, until then I was pretty much just doing uh, acoustic, uh, like Marshall Tucker band and that kind of stuff, doing the acoustic leads in that, and that's where I was. My head was at the time, but like I said, the more I heard other people playing electric slide. The more I said, yeah, that's the, that's the ticket. That's the place I want to be. So, and once I learned how to play slide with open tuning, I've maintained to this day. If I'd have learned how to play the guitar in open tuning before I learned how to play in standard, I would never have learned standard mm -hmm. because open tuning is just so simple and, and sweet. Mm -hmm. You know, it just one little movement of it just says volumes. <laughs> so it's incredible. So that's how that all happened, and yeah. that was uh, the early 80s uh, when I was working in the Midland area. And then uh, I had gone out and bought a bunch of uh, equipment <laughs> so I could play gigs. Well, as it turned out, within that few months, the only bands that were working in this area were country bands. So we had to put together a country band which we did, and it sucked, but, <laughs> but we were making money, and I was paying off my equipment. <laughs> I called it, the, the real name of the band, the first one was Sweetwater, oh. and then it became Stampede, but the whole time I called it the Dumb Hat Band, <laughs> because Dumb we all wore some sort of, I wore a Flatlander hat, you know, people would come in and see me up on stage and they'd say, how'd they get that Amish guy up there? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. So we did that for a few years and uh, got my equipment all paid off and uh, then I got an opportunity to open for uh, John Prine. Boy, how did that happen? It was that, that because Leon of the Russell connections? Gig. Yeah, okay. The Leon Russell gig. Right. Got me, finally, you know, after some time had passed, uh, they approached me and wanted me to go on tour with John Prine. Were you going to go back to sort of the folk blues thing again when you opened for Prine? That's what I kind of assumed. I never met him. Mm -hmm. Never got to meet him. I went home and told my ex-wife, you know, that I was going on tour with John Prine. And she says, well, if you go on tour with John Bryan, when you get back, we won't be here. Who's <laughs> we? My daughter, her son, and her. If you go on tour with John Bryan, when you get back, we won't be here. So mm -hmm. I was crushed. And I literally, in a fit of stupidity, I sold everything that in my house that made music. I didn't even own a guitar. 
And I said, I am not doing this. I'm done. If I can't do it the way I want to do it, I'm not doing it at all. I went for about two years where I never even touched a guitar. So you didn't go out with him then? You had the chance, well, but didn't go? Well, I couldn't go? bear to lose my daughter. Yeah, well, that's understandable. And, uh, and she was serious. She's Sicilian, and she wasn't fooling around. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't bear to part with my daughter, you know, in that way. So That's a good father. Well, she's a good girl. Yeah. Well, you know her now. Yep, she's, yeah, now she's a good girl. <laughs> now she, oh yeah, she was a handful. All this used to be a nice dark brown. <laughs> I never had a gray hair on my head until my daughter turned a teenager. Oh, yeah, well. And then it all went, whew. <laughs> Those are the challenging years. Yep. So you meet, uh, you, uh, Levi, you, how did you meet Hooker? Well, the... I had a, my CD was out. It was in the jukebox. The CD was in the jukebox, right? Yeah, at the double D. Yeah, at the double D. And Hooker's friend, JP, had heard it. And I hadn't, he hadn't met me yet, but he heard a few of the songs on there, which included some slide guitar, um, who JP assumed was me. And um, as did I. And and so did Hooker. So JP went to Hooker and said, man, you got to listen to this chick. So they went to the Double D, listened to the CD, and Hooker says... I looked at JP and completely tongue-in-cheek, I had no intention of ever meeting this woman. I looked at JP and said, I'm having me some of that. <laughs> <laughs> so and the, right. bar, and the bartender says, right. hey, I know her. I said, sure you do. Next time she's in the house, introduce me. And he said, okay, I will. He said, all right, I will. So that weekend, a buddy of mine was playing, his band was playing the, the Double D at, that night. And I walk in, and I'm looking around, and the bartender's going. So I go up to the bar, and he said, guess who's in the house? I said, Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Levi Rose. I said, well, 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 there. <laughs> So sure enough, he introduced me, and uh, I spazzed out. We went out the back door, and I'm, you know, I'm talking like, "Boy, I love the way you play the guitar. I love the way you sing. I love your music. I love your songs. You want to hire another guitar player because I can play the guitar and I play slide too." <laughs> and, she, and she said, "Are you always this spastic?" And I said, "Yeah, kinda." <laughs> That's almost verbatim, you guys. Oh wow! Oh, wow. <laughs> so he was he at that time. You had the band Cobalt Justice Blues Review. Correct. And he asked me to come and um, try out. Audition. To yeah. audition. So I went out to Doc's farm in the garage there, did a few songs with them, and they decided to hire me. For, for I Brett. decided to you hire You decided. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't part of that process. Well, the boys, you know, at that point in time, I did 90% of the vocals. And I was the front man, and we had been working together for some months, and we had a really good 55 songs that we were just tight. And it was really working. We were getting a lot of shows. We were having a lot of fun, making some good money. Well, then she came and auditioned, and uh, <laughs> when she left, the drummer, Doc, said, Boy, she's trouble. And I said, Yeah, <laughs> she sure is. I said, uh, we got to learn some of her stuff. He said, wait, wait what? <laughs> I said, yeah, I, I can't be doing all the vocals anymore. She, you know, we got to get her in there doing vocals. And we tried that for a while, and the boys just never got the enthusiasm that I wanted to see. So we fired ourselves mm -hmm. from Cobalt Blues Review, and we came up with... Uh, Leon or Leon Levi Rose experience. Her and I, and we hired another bass player and another rhythm player and a drummer, and off we went. That's how that happened. Wow. So Levi, where did you know? Going back, when did you start in this music thing? Where did you grow up, and when did you first get involved in playing guitar and singing and all this stuff? The singing started when I lived in Colorado. That's where I grew up and went to school. My connection with Michigan is my um, father's side of the family in Mount Pleasant. Um, so I would, my grandmother, oh, she had two boys. She always wanted a girl. 
I was the first grandchild, let alone granddaughter, born on either side of the family. And uh, so she took a real liking to me. And, uh, so we would come up here every summer for summer breaks. And um, I was in a, I formed a trio a cappella group in high school called Meat and Potatoes, M E E T, not M E A. And um, we, we, um, that was my senior year, I believe, when we did that. And we, we just played a couple of coffee houses um, and sang, on, sang out on the street for some sort of festival in Denver. And that was fun. And um, This is long before the big boulder scene, I assume, then. I mean, Denver's always had a thing, but boulder really blew up after that, didn't it? Right. Or is that right around then? Because that was 1985. That's close. So, yeah, yeah but then I, I split shortly after high school and moved up here and um, started hanging out with friends and hanging out with musicians, loving live music at Stagecoach Lounge in uh, Mount Pleasant. Let's see, the Stagecoach. Rubbles. What was your um, underground place? Oh, that was long after. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, was hanging out there and smoozing the the musicians um, asking, "Hey, can I get up and sing Bobby McGee?" That was that was my end, you know. Oh. I was always up there doing Bobby McGee with them. And shortly after that, well, a couple a couple of years after that, um, formed a band called Focal Point with um, a couple of kids from CMU, and we were doing about. 90% originals and a few covers just to appease the establishment, and <laughs> we were having a really good time. Were, were you a country band or a rock band? Or we what? were rock and I don't, kind of new age rock. I'm not even sure how to explain it. I, rock and roll is the best way to put mm -hmm. it, I guess. We were doing um, Jefferson Airplane, um, some Eagles. You did. You sang a few uh, Led Zeppelin songs, too. Yeah, we did a couple of Led Zeppelin tunes too. So Trust me, she can sing Zeppelin. <laughs> so mm. we were all over the place. So I enjoyed that for about a year, and then that that kind of fell apart. That's what happens when you join. You know, put a band. Sometimes happens when you put a band together of college students. Well, yeah, people move on. Yeah, yeah. yeah so they they moved on, and then shortly after that, I met um, Stephen Baker, who was a guitar player acoustic guitar player he was an uh, ambulance driver in Mount Pleasant and um, we just kind of clicked you know writing music together and so we started doing a few few we were doing open mics and uh, he was really stage fright so that didn't work out too well but he was real decent in the studio so we met someone who had a studio in their apartment you know had decent equipment and everything um, another friend of mine at the time said, hey, you need to record a demo, I'll pay for it, get in there and do it. So, Baby Steps, my first album, was supposed to be a demo oh, okay. album, but then I was enjoying it so much, I said, well, this has to be an album. So, <laughs> but it's very different, you know, if I feel like, you know, most every song on it is not like the other, it's not one genre. It's all sorts of different genres. That was my idea of what a demo should be. Yeah. Um, so these are all your original songs? All but one, which was a Joplin cover of Turtle Blues. Okay. Which I contacted them about and made sure that I could record it. And he said, yeah, sure, you know, get a hold of us when you, send, when you sell 10,000 copies, and then we'll talk <laughs> about what you owe us. I said, okay, thank you, click. <laughs> um, but before that, I... Did a little bit of a, I did a summer down in Lake Huron, and I was just a vagabond. I was doing thread dreads on, on the streets to make my money, to pay my car insurance, um, was staying with a friend. That friend had a friend who played bass and had a drummer, and so we decided we were going to put together a heavy metal band. Yeah. So Levi ventures off into heavy metal, and... Uh, 
This bass player says, you know, I know the drummer of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and he's going to let us stay at his place out there as soon as we get all our music together. And, you know, he's going to help us record, and he's going to do this, and he's going to do that. And I'm thinking, this is too good to be true, right? But the kid had his address. So I sat down and wrote him a, a, a brief letter. You know, hey, this... I don't even remember the guy's name. Not Jed the, Smith. Not... Oh, no, not the... That drummer, the bass oh. player friend, oh, right, yeah, who yeah. was promising all this stuff. So I wrote to Jed, you know, this guy says that you can do all this. If you can, that's fantastic. We look forward to working with you. If not, I'd like to know right away before I put any more time and effort into this project. And I left him my phone number. And, of course, I was not home when he called. <laughs> so I got a voicemail on the answering machine. And... Uh, him letting me know, yeah, none of that was going to happen. That, you know, <laughs> the kid had a, a good heart and good intentions, but no, nothing like that was going to happen. And that it, it would probably be in my best interest if I stepped away from involving myself any further with him. Wow. Yeah. yeah so. Chad Smith letting you know. Chad, yeah. Was he was from Earl Oak, so. Mm-hmm. So that's how that went down. So then the, the next is the, the Levi Rose band. Does that, that come out of that? Well, so I recorded Baby Steps. The album came out. I wasn't working with Stephen Baker anymore <coughs> just because I needed to move on to something else. I really didn't know what I was going to do at that point. you know. And that's about the time that I met Lucker. What did you hook oh, yeah. up with Harley Mullins before you and I met? Well, Harley Mullins was a friend of mine. We weren't planning on doing a band together oh, oh, okay. at all, but he did um, inspired me to write a song on Baby Steps called um, Taking a Walk. I don't know where it came from. We were just sitting in his room one day. He was laid up because he had broken his leg or something, so I went to go visit him. And he's sitting there playing the acoustic guitar, just an easy riff, and these words just came out of nowhere. It just hit me like a rolling ball of thunder. Oh, a very intimate part of my life, you know, in, in different, well, three verses, right? And that ended up being a song that still today, to this day, I still have people who picked up that album, women particularly, who have told me that that one song got them through a really horrific time in their life. Mm -hmm. That they listened to that, and that gave them the, the strength and the power to get through. They Is that about leaving a toxic relationship, basically? Is oh. <laughs> it's about sexual assault. Oh. Yeah. And the court system. And, mm. and walking away. Saying no. Is that on Baby Steps? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember you you were one of the few artists uh in the early nineties when you when I go record shopping, there'd be either cassettes or CDs mm -hmm. and, and you were you were in every store. There was like you, Lori Middlebrook, One Trick Ponies, <laughs> Round in the Distant Few. I think Lizard was around here and uh it's a couple other people out of Midland maybe, but um there was you know, a Seldoma, the metal guys. But it was like always could find your music everywhere and, and you were on the trail, you know, on the tour local trail everywhere around town and uh that was in the early 90s right so, and did you record one not soon after that or you were going to record one i know we want to talk about hooker man's record too but right what was did you put anything together after that record after babies yes yeah. no not, not until i got together with hooker okay. we, and then him and i later on into it after we fired ourselves from the band that we put together after we fired ourselves from the other band um we met up with a, a, a gentleman who had a recording studio in Clare, and we started laying down some tracks there, which was some nice work. It never got completed because uh, at that point we had basically come out to the world that we were together, we were a couple, and we were suffering some serious backlash, like tires getting slashed and everything here in Michigan, and some friends of ours who lived in Indiana came up to visit. We told them what was going on, and they said, well, why don't you just get out of town for a while, let things cool down, and come stay with us. 
So we went down to Indiana for six months or so, something like that. I think it was eight months, actually. Yeah. 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 And that and that was enough time to cool things. Yeah. And by the time we got back, everything was squared away. Right. So and we went back to work. So that was the only record. I still have you mm. know, copies of those recordings. But, um, yeah. Well, then she was she did the backup vocals on yeah. Confession Lies and ter- Fairy Tales. Which is your record. That's mine, yeah. And when did that come out? Because I remember that popped out, too. And I don't remember. what In, in the mid-90s? Was uh, it? Mid-90s? Yeah. Yeah, no, it was closer. I think it was 1999, actually. Okay, 90. the end of the 90s. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. That could yeah, because we were at the Little House in, in Coleman. When, when we Confessions were, came out? Yeah. Yep, by God, we were. Yep. So that was 1999. Wow. Yeah, because that was uh, the, the following year when the millennium changed. Right. And everybody in Coleman was losing their minds. Oh, Y2K. <laughs> yeah, Y2K. <laughs> yeah. So now, that, that, I, I, I want to go back to the hooker band. You, you were you were writing tunes. You know, you were talking about the whole Johnny Winter thing. Were you writing songs throughout the 70s? Because you said by that 80s gig, you had all originals going for a while. Well, yeah, I wrote a lot of songs in the 70s, but they were campfire, country, western folk yeah. stuff. I didn't really do much electric stuff because right. that's what I, what was selling. You know, I'm, I needed to work, mm-hmm. so I was doing that kind of stuff. But I wrote some songs that, uh, since I have converted from a, a typical CFG uh, cowboy chord progression to something a little more elaborate with slide. Mm-hmm. And converted them into other into something a little more upbeat. Little so, more. what what kind of material ended up going in the nineties? Did you just write fresh, or or was it some of your old stuff that you got to bring <laughs> along for that record? I very seldom um, repurposed oh. an older song. I would use the general concept of it and juice it up, change the lyrics, change the melody, you know, and add slide and just have a little more fun with it. Mm-hmm. But uh, I wrote a lot of stuff after that. that so you got a load. That was, that was slide and yeah. hot rod stuff. Uh, I just never was a rocker. Right. I'm, I was more like a blues rock. Yeah. You know, I liked I liked the distortion and the sustain and the, well, like I said, the Johnny Winter stuff. Mm-hmm. Now that's borderline rock and roll. Right. But it's not hardcore rock. It's more blues, and that's I got into that. And boy, did I have a good time! <laughs> and, and and a lot of stuff I wrote was in that vein, and that came out around the time you met her, putting it on the record. Is it was a freshening right. up right. a whole new batch of tunes, right? So right. you got a backlog of music. If looking I, back, then I, I, I was going to call. I was going to call my next CD a "Briefcase Full of Blues." <laughs> yeah. Right on. <laughs> you must have a load of them. Brothers already used that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> and and Levi, you wrote as well all along your whole oh, yeah. career. You always had lyrics or some idea, and you were going along. Um, take us into the aughts with you two, because that's when we I started. I was out playing. I'd run into you guys. You guys were doing open mics, hosting them everywhere. You yeah. guys were the you guys were the twins on the scene. Like everybody could f- count on you guys to be there. Well, we uh, started. Uh, hitting the local clubs and to be perfectly honest we told them flat out you don't have to pay us we will host an open mic we'll provide all the gear we'll provide everything but anything you get over an average for example tuesday night whatever the z tape is average anything you get over that we get 20 percent we started doing it that way, and sometimes we made okay, and sometimes we had to pay for our own meal, you know, because mm-hmm. when we first started into the open mic thing, it wasn't going real well, but we were playing all over. We had a little circuit going that we were playing from Coleman, mm-hmm. Clare, Harrison, Gladwin, Beaverton, <gasps> Midland, and we had a circuit going, so by the time we got back to this place, we had at least four more new songs Mm -hmm. so we had a constant rotation Uh, of material (laughs) and people started showing up because we supplied all the gear we set it all up and when they go on stage we dialed them in so they sounded good and they were kind of starting to like that plus i provided amps 
and uh, often a drummer, a drum kit, and uh, it started to get really good. So we were doing the whole circuit, but then some people came along and were turning it into something that wasn't what we wanted. So we became the house band at the Double D Saloon in Coleman. And we did every Tuesday night from 8 to 11, we did open mic. And that rocketed completely out of control. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think I remember meeting you at uh, the Sanford Eagles doing an open yeah, mic. Yeah, that that I come there often. I would I host when you guys weren't you. hosting, but Scott would book me all the time. And uh, yeah, then you guys invited me to Coleman to play. Yeah, uh, I think a couple times we've, yeah. we did a couple yeah. of those with you guys. Yeah, yeah. But that really became a, a, a good deal. We were really drawing, we were drawing people from Lansing and Grand Rapids and yeah. Saginaw, Bay yeah. City. You know, we were really pulling in a good crowd and making some good money. Yeah, that was quite the an era of uh, it was like beat the DJs thing. Like the DJs were really on the come out, and you guys were putting your foot down and saying, "Why don't you guys come out and perform? Let's let's keep this alive." Yeah, yep. And your album had just came out prior to that, and you guys would always include original music in those sets, which is what intrigued me. Yeah. And I remember you guys would always have a segment where you'd just lay it out for everybody. Yeah. And I remember fun. you were particularly fond of uh, the Orient Bay song, the one about the crab. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that that's always been a favorite. <laughs> you guys got some good stuff. It, it's it's great. Did you guys have you guys done anything since then, musically, recording wise, um, in the last? Yeah, we know a guy that lives not far from here. Well, he? Scott Baker. <laughs> Before that. <laughs> Before that. Yeah. Is there anything else that you guys been up to up up to the whole COVID thing? Like, it, it, you guys slowed down a little in that era. Well, you guys were writing. I know that. Frankly, I. Uh, I had a real bad bout with arthritis, mm -hmm. and some things happened in the music business that gave me a real bad taste for it. Right. And it was so painful to play, I didn't even want to play. You told me that, yeah. That's and, unbelievable. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was really a hard time for me. I couldn't play, and I couldn't sing. And I thought, you know, for all intents and purposes, my life's over. Mm -hmm. But uh, she got me through it. And you guys started kicking it back in a couple of years ago at the studio, at my studio, yeah, Harvest Canteen. Yeah. But I, I still won't, I'm not, absolutely will not go back and play in a bar. Uh, I was a beer salesman for 30 years, and I'm done with that. Now I want to play nice little places and intimate little clubs, things like that. And, and do what you want to do. do. Yeah, exactly. Play what I want to play. Yep. And not try to worry about bringing people in. To, are, there, are there many of those kind of places around? That I mean, no. even in the bars, there's there's so few that are even offering live yeah. music anymore. Well, there, go ahead. You're absolutely right, but I look at it the same way I did when we started doing the open mics. When we started doing open mics, they were faltering. Hardly anybody showed up at them because, frankly, they weren't very good. Uh, man, whoever hosted the open mic brought in their gear, and a lot of people that was host that were hosting open mics didn't have really adequate gear so we started going in and hosting and bringing good gear and, and good people and it started to catch on and at that point in time there wasn't any place that was really doing that yeah. but once we brought a, an air of professionalism to it it really started to take off and we we really had a good time so we did it once maybe we could do it again what kind of place are you looking like at at coffee houses or something like that well, or like i said i want to get out of the bar scenes because like i said that I, I wish i had a nickel for every time i had to play and sing while people sat there drunk yeah yeah i want to get away from that and into a more cerebral kind of a grouping uh there are a couple places in midland that i i hear are doing really well um Something Midland Grains or something? Yeah, that's the one that Bob Hausler plays at quite often. Yeah, the my the yeah. my yeah. East Side's playing there tomorrow yeah, night. Yeah, my Grains and Element or something? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Mike so Smith I've heard of a couple of those tomorrow. that are doing well. So we thought we would, you know, once we've got a little material, I told her once I could, I got four songs in the basket that I can get up and play without hesitation and confidence. We'll go out and we'll hit some of these places and see what's going on and see if we can fit back in and, you know, make it happen. 
There's another little place in Sanford, actually. It's like a, a winery, a little wine spot that has been, uh, they're, they've got music in there every weekend. Okay. So, I have to check that out. I don't, I didn't you know, hear about just, that. just a small, intimate atmosphere. I think, is, is I think there's a, a lot of musicians right now that do original music mainly or, or come from the aesthetic of the old background are looking for the, the places where they can be heard mm-hmm. over just a bar where you're expected to play two stones covers and uh, whatever else the audience yells at you and a couple of your own, you know, right. it's, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's a movement again. It's, it's starting to change around. I hear it from other co original musicians, you know, yeah. being that's been my thing since day one uh, myself. Uh, but I, you, one thing we didn't touch on tonight yet. And I wanted to ask you, Levi, you've played with uh, a handful of girls out of the Sanford uh, <laughs> area the, and you guys, wherever you go, there's always, can you name them and, and talk a little bit about how, the spark of the quartet of, of the ladies and all that. There's like a, a There's, when people went to be, get background vocals for records, you could always count on mid Michigan having them. Cause you guys were always part of this thing. And there's a, right. you and Kimberly McGoran, Kimberly McGoran, Kelly Beck yeah. and Deb Cochran. Deb Cochran. Yep. Um, um, yeah. Kim Mall. Kim Mall. Yeah. Boy, she can Who's sing. The other one, Papa? Um, she's still kicking it. Carrie West Bay. Carrie, yeah, and she's yeah. north of you guys. She's Grayling, yeah, right? Yeah, but she was. Yep, Carrie's. You know, she's our troubadour right now. Were really huge yep. in supporting open mic because they understood what we were. Another thing that we were trying to really promote <laughs> during that that whole time was original material. Yeah, um, that's why you guys called me. Right. You're like, hey, you got a record out. Oh, can you bring some of that here? Right. And I'm like, an open mic wants you to play. I I, I never played open mic, so yeah. it was more fun hearing that from an artist <laughs> uh, than rather than show up and see what's available, you know? And the, the yeah. thing that was cool about that grouping, at that point, I was just starting to be brave enough to play my guitar out. Uh, Did I you had- say that you didn't play guitar up until you met Hooker Man? I knew three chords when I met Hooker. And now you can get through a now whole evening. Now four. I know five. <laughs> I know five. <laughs> I even know how to play barn chords. That's true. Which I never thought in a million years when I first learned them. I said, no, this is crap. I'm not doing and this. And sevenths and ninths. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when I, when I, Deb Cochran plays key, keys, right? Kim Burley and Kim play guitar. Kelly Beck was pretty fresh on fresh to the scene of playing guitar too when we all first met and mandolin. so and well and kim all plays well yeah they both play mandolin yeah. but um you know getting together it was girl power you know it was yeah. empowering to, it's one thing to have the guys show you licks and everything but it was a whole another yeah feeling i think i saw that before i knew of the you and hooker ran together because it was always a pairing because kimberly mcgorn jumped early on with what i was doing yeah. and i think that's where i realized you were up north doing your thing and i already knew your cds i mean everybody knew the music to come through yeah. from my era anyway yeah. you know but uh it was like oh these chicks are always getting together singing up there and there's a few photos and deb moved away and you guys had a little reunion when she came back for a funeral yeah. Yeah. yeah i remember the funeral for our our buddy here in town we still stay in matt, touch matt douglas yeah. yeah for matt yeah oh yeah man yeah. so that was a fun reunion we we did that and then we also played um a little two-hour gig at decker's bar in midland it's a funny story about decker's if you'd like to hear oh, it. Yeah. yes hooker, hooker and i were playing as a duet i think it was an open mic at the that, that bar I can't think of the name of. Okay, it was a ho- it's not there anymore, but it was what's the name of the street in Midland? Bay City Bay City Road. Bay City Road. It was in between Bay City Road and Bay City Road. Go- no. Yeah. No, no. No, no. Okay, well this is the way I'm remembering it. Bay City Road and the it goes this way and the one that goes this way, in between there was a little bar. I can't think of the name of it. Okay, well. The way I remember the story is we were playing at McNamara's Pub and the soon-to-be owner of Decker's, or he'd already bought it. Oh, yeah, Jim. Jim stopped in, watched our show and everything, and um, he said, how you, How would you guys like to come in once a week? You know, I'll pay you X amount, which was a good money, whatever he had offered us. I want to get the music going in my new bar. He was from California, and we had this really nice discussion about, 
you know, businesses don't have to be fighting against one another. We can build one another up and not take anything from one another. And that's the kind of vibe I want to bring to Decker's uh, Lounge. And I want you guys to come in and help build up the music scene for us. And we said, well, sure, this sounds like fun. You know, we get paid and you're going to feed us and we get a nice venue. You know, every musician likes to be fed. Sure, certainly. Um, Yeah, they serve good food, too. So we brought, (laughs) there was another spot we were opening up for open mic. And Decker's, as far as I know, is still going pretty strong. Yeah. I just remembered the name of the bar that I'm talking about is Bushy's. Bushies. I was thinking the Boulevard no, was no, Bushies. No, yeah. So, yeah. Boulevard. Now, you guys brought an acoustic. Are you guys going to give us a good song or two tonight or whatever? Are you guys yeah. got a little something we can uh, regale us with, please? Yes. We, we, we've only we been love blessed it when with, we get music on yeah, this thing. You know, and I uh, I was just telling uh, these guys today about the bringing a guitar, and they're like, why didn't you tell us this earlier? And I'm like, I forget about it. I mean, we get yeah, surprised come on with this. Yeah, you know. Uh, what are we paying you all this money for, you know, if you're not going to remember that? So were you a fan of uh, John Lee Hooker? Pardon? Were you a fan of John Lee Hooker? Still am. Okay, well, I'm just wondering. Elmore James. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, anybody that played slide guitar with soul and passion, I'm a fan. Mm-hmm. I, I love them all. I did bring one song for you. All right, great. And it's an original. Cool. Because I got the vibe from Scott that he would much rather have an original than yeah, if you guys can, that'd be great. Wow, what's wrong, baby? It's just cold weather. Yeah. It's another reason, one of the reasons that I fell in love with them, the stories. Oh, yeah. 27 years we've been together, and I just heard a new one <laughs> the other day. Okay. First time ever. <laughs> so that's why I I go ahead and listen to the old ones. Well, sure. I know sooner or later another new one is going to pop up. So this is a song that I wrote when I was working at the... (laughs) This sounds so gurney. When I was working at the Mount Pleasant Bowling Alley on the back of an envelope, right? I mean, it's just classic. Oh, what more inspirational place would you need? What position hasn't worked as a real person at the bowling alley, right? (laughs) And written a song on the back of a nap. Right, yeah. Right, true. So anyway, I was thinking about an old friend and just kind of, again, like that other song that just kind of spilled out and, uh, yeah. What's it called? Old Friend. Old Friend. I like to keep it song. Old Friend.
nice yeah you touched on that common theme of you know you there's some people that you know you may not have seen them for 25 years and it's like a day has not passed you know when you get with them again kind of feeds into that feeling that's great thank you thank you one of the lines two of the lines i really like in that song uh haven't seen you in a coon's age where have you ever heard that in the song <laughs> that's right i don't know <laughs> right but that's great you that's, needed it that's kind of it's a regional thing yeah right? it is i didn't yeah. hear that that saying until i came up here well michigan. that's a michigan saying sure <laughs> and then the double non ton did we catch that on the, the last verse maybe yeah Think about it. I, I, I was just enjoying <laughs> the song <laughs> can you explain it <laughs> Oh, uh, maybe later. All right, all right. This is a PG show, right? <laughs> That's right. Sometimes. And we'll just leave it. Sometimes. Is that something about coming? Uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> Won't you come inside? Yeah, there we are. Uh, <laughs> Gary remembered the lyrics. Yeah, I'm, I'm well, always enjoying are. the tune. Yeah. I'm impressed. <laughs> you know, my, my mind is always in the uh, gutter. What can yeah. I say? Well, when we're sitting in uh, Studio 163 where the normal podcast coming out of here is usually... Uh, x-rated so yeah that makes oh, sense okay yeah. that explains the horns yeah yeah hooker man you got a tune you want to play or not tonight no not right now okay i know you've been warming up i heard that you've been playing pretty much since uh november or december she said every day he's been playing lately so that's fact and it's uh it's beginning to work but it's beginning to look a lot like hooker man here difficulty with the arthritis shoot wow brother what Spring is on its way. When yeah, the that's temperature right. changes, it, may, it, it really does make a difference. In, oh, this is the worst the time of year in Michigan yeah. where it's cold and damp. Well, and, and as she pointed out, I've been playing even through the discomfort. Yeah. But it's not sounding up to, up your to my standards. Yeah. Up to his standards. I'm here to tell you it sounds great. Yeah, it sounds good. You well, guys we wish are, you the best. Yeah, I'll see if we get to get you guys back out doing those little intimate shows uh, by the end of the year this year, I'm or even back, back in the back studio. The studio. Yeah, yeah. I know. There. I know. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, and Levi's on my new record. I'm going to. I've talk. done that myself. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you two for coming. We yeah, had a great show. It was wonderful meeting you. Yeah, it's really, really, really good to meet all of you. The MMHP is hosted on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and our own Libsyn podcast site. You can also search MMHP989 on Facebook for up-to-the-minute information, as well as both Dr. J and Sir Fred's album picks of the week, posted every weekend. Don't forget to look for Mr. Mike's local music live series, posted frequently on MMHP's Facebook hub, as well as Scott's Mid-Mitten 15 from Harvest Canteen, featuring one-on-one -on -one interviews with Michigan music artists. You can connect with Scott on the web at scottbakermusic.com, Dr. J at michiganrockandrolllegends.com, Sir Fred at fredreif.com, Mr. Mike at YouTube at MrBT1. That's M-R-B-T-E-E -E and the number one. Brought to you by Michigan Rock and Roll Legends, located both inside the Bay County Historical Museum on Washington Avenue, as well as Scotty's Sandbar on Evergreen Drive at the Bay City Middle Ground. On behalf of our hosts, Dr. J, Sir Fred, Mr. Mike, and myself, this podcast wouldn't have been here without the voice of the MMHP, Mr. Eddie Switek, the generosity of the Bay County Historical Museum, which hosts the Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame, as well as this podcast, Mr. Alan Garcia all of our guests, and especially to the listeners. 
we want to thank you. Been together over 20 years, and we still act like dorks. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I hope we never stop. <laughs> well, there you go. 27, think, but I'm not really. Yeah, we got right. the dorky romantics. So hey, at least we got some Michigan music here tonight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love yeah. this. This, this was fabulous, so man. Yeah. Did you be happy you I came? I felt like I fit yeah. in. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm so glad you came to tell your yeah. stories, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's uh, Michigan music stories. So.